you might expect that the sermon title might have something to do with grace. Hmm. Well, it says the title is What Guides Us. It actually doesn't have the word grace in it. But what does guide our direction in life, I think, is the message here this morning. And in a lot of ways, there's a lot of things that steer our direction, that steers our mind, that steers us from decisions to make. Some of the decisions we don't want to make, but we make them anyways. Because grace has not invaded our lives. So we want to be careful what grace, what direction, what decisions we make in life. And that grace is a part of that. Amen? Amen? I'm going to invite my scripture reader up, Lynn, this morning. First Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 10 and 11. New Living Translation. But whatever I am now... It is all because God poured out his special favors on me, and not without results. For I have worked harder than any of the other apostles, yet it is not I but God who was working through me by his grace. So it makes no difference whether I preach or they preach, for we all preach the same message you have already believed. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks. 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 Thank you. As Christian, what steers our direction in life? What steers our desires? There's a better question. And more importantly, where do you see God's grace along the way? I will share a bit about the three graces that John Wesley emphasized the importance of our heart's desires. You've heard the phrase, where our hearts be, there you will be. So whatever your heart desires, that's what you're going to strive for. I'll share a bit of John Wesley's, the John Wesley's words this morning. But first we're going to do a little fun. And during the the Christmas season, I don't share a lot of Christmas funny, so I've got a few of them built up that we'll, we'll share. And this one's about a lost purse, and sometimes a lost purse doesn't always have in it what you would like to see in a lost purse that's found by a little boy. A lady lost her handbag in the bustle of Christmas shopping. It was found by an honest little boy and returned it to her. Looking at her purse, he commented, hmm, that's funny. When I lost my bag, there was a $20 bill in it. Now there's $21 bills in it. The boy quickly replied, replied, That's right, lady. The last time I found the lady's purse, she didn't have enough change to provide any reward. <laughs> <laughs> so he put 20 singles in it. If you love that, give God a hand. Might, one might think in the, scripture, in, the, in the scripture that Lynn read this morning that there may be a bit of arrogance in the Apostle Paul's scripture here. Here's the huge difference. Paul understood where the strength and power came from and that it was not his doing. Really important. I think we could all learn something from this. Having done HR for 45 years in my business, I always promoted to do your best when no one is looking. Boy, wouldn't that be great in America if America used that model? And you will be rewarded for it. Understand that you will be noticed and you will be compensated accordingly. This is the very message Paul was trying to get across to the other apostles. But it didn't matter because he was looked down on anyways. He wasn't respected. Isn't that like us today? Work hard to get ahead in a group, in a group setting, and the freeloaders complain you're making them look bad. I've seen it. 
Unfortunately, I've seen it. A guy works really hard and wants to get promoted, wants to get a raise, and I did HR, so he would, we'd have our annual meetings and he would come in and tell me how, how much he's done and how much he's progressed. And there was a, there was a survey that they had to fill out and he, he expanded all of the areas in the survey and he was worthy of a raise. Well, that's wonderful, but he didn't fit in because the other employees looked down at him because they make them look bad. And my response is, work, to work towards improving your status. Work toward improving your situation. Don't worry about other people. And that's what we do. We compare ourselves to other people in the world, which is awful. Be the best you can at what you have. John Wesley, do the best you can, and I'm not going to get this correct, but do the best you can with whatever you have, as much as you have, with everybody you have. Do the best you have with what you have. This is the very message Paul was trying to get across to the other apostles. <coughs> we must depend on God's grace to make sure we don't fall in that trap. The way of the world can't fall in the ways of the world. And as Christians, we're called not to, actually. We are to be set apart. We are not to blend in. We are not to be of this world, but only in this world. Trusting that God goes before us in everything we do to heal, forgive, and to be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? Amen. I think we all could look back and say, God had everything to do with that wonderful outcome, even if we had fallen away. You can think back in your life and think of the times that were maybe troublesome, times that were difficult, times that were challenged. You can look back and you, you might say, there was grace in that. And at the time, I may not have seen the grace or invited the grace into that environment or into that situation. But grace was there. It's interesting that I look back as a builder and I would meet clients to build their dream home and how the, how the provenient grace was evident. The grace that we all have and how our subconscious simply takes over. And I would say thank you, God. The second grace I would like to lift up this morning is justifying grace. John Wesley stressed the importance of these graces and that when we follow the teachings of the scriptures, we will have a keen sense of why we are here. Some pastor uses that word why often. Why did we have a church building here built 140 years ago? Why did people come in this door? Why did we come in this door on Sunday morning and other times? It's not new today. The why is the same as it was 2,000 years ago that John Wesley emphasized. We live in a world where we try and justify everything we do. We justify if we do something good, but more importantly, we justify when we do something that we don't feel really good about. But we justify it. God is not asking us to make exceptions for our fleshly desires. He is asking us to be obedient. I'm going to tap into that subconscious again. What is our motives and why do we do what we do? Being in the corporate world most of my life and since retired, I didn't realize that most folks have a motive for what they say and do. And I'm sorry to say, most of it is to satisfy the flesh. This is not God's economy. God is not asking that we turn from our sins. Asking that God is asking that we turn from our sins and ask God to forgive us. When's the last time individually, alone with God, you've asked him, to forgive me.
sincerely forgive me. You might pray this, Dear God, please forgive me that I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have broken your law and I ask <coughs> that you too please forgive me. That's a phrase we should memorize. Because I don't know for you, but for me, I need forgiveness. <laughs> More often than not, I need forgiveness. There's so much comfort in knowing that God will forgive you and will give you the opportunity to get back on track. That's where we fall from grace. And how do we get back on the horse again? Father God, I'm sorry. I knew I shouldn't have made that decision. Help me. Help me to get back on track. Please forgive me. Say, please forgive me. Please, please forgive, forgive me. me. Mm. We continue to journey toward perfection in Christ through the opportunity that God has placed before us. Apostle Paul in our scripture this morning understood that his works were not of his doing, but by the grace of God. When I hear that phrase, you hear people from time to time say, by the grace of God, I do it, and I pick up on it, which I kind of love the conversation, because I try to start a conversation. Oh, but by the grace of God, or for the grace of God, whatever it might be. What is meant by that phrase, by the grace of God? <coughs> Decisions and actions that we all make, are they by the grace of God? When we stay on that horse, we stay on that saddle, when we stay on that grace for Christ, it doesn't matter where that horse is going because a path will be made clear and it will be lit by the light of Christ. Amen? Amen. This is the key point this morning, folks. Don't miss this. Paul writes in Galatians 6, 8 about seeds from the Living Bible. Each of us have to ask ourselves what fruit are we producing for the one we love when we come here to worship every Sunday. Let me say that again. Each of us have to ask ourselves, what fruit are we producing for the one we love when we come here to worship every Sunday? I'm going to go back to the why do we come to church. There's days we come to church because we need it. We need to go to church. Maybe it is to check the box. I don't know. I pray it's not. We come to church to fill our soul because we're uneasy. Have you ever thought of coming to church? May, just may be, somebody else needs to hear your kind word. Someone else needs to hear your compassion. Somebody else may need something, may need to hear something from you or me that lifts them up. We all come with baggage. We all come with trouble situations. And if we don't get encouragement from the church, where are we going to get it from? We have a responsibility, folks. All of us have a responsibility because we love Christ. We love Christ. And if we love Christ, it shouldn't be difficult. Because we have the grace of God in us. God's grace. Hmm. We understand provenient grace, justifying grace, and now sanctifying grace. A time to examine what we do with our time. Who we spend most of our time with. How much, time, how, how much of our time is spent drawing closer to your Lord and Savior. I dismiss the phrase, I don't have time for this or I don't have time for that. If you're a Christian, you have time for God. Amen? Amen. How you choose to do that is entirely up to you. I don't have time for God. You have time for God. Your choices in life choose that God is not up on the scale of 1 to 10. Society, culture tells us it's probably not even in the top 10 today. Breaks my heart. Breaks my heart. I can't tell you. I so pray for every human being on this earth. 
every single week that they find Christ and they find the grace of God. And not when there's a death in the family, not when there's a tragedy taking place, not when a health report comes back, that we find the grace of God so that we can live a life of joy and peace and comfort. And as important, as the scriptures remind us, to help one another, to live in unity with one another, and more importantly, to love one another. I may not like everything my children do. I may not like all the decisions my children have made, but it doesn't matter because I love my kids unconditionally. And I will never stop loving him more right now, this very moment, than anything in the world. Isn't that God's love for us? God loves us. God loves us. It doesn't matter what we do. And he forgives us and takes us back. The grace that is exhibited by the fruit in us. Hmm. Be careful whatever you do, that it reflects what Paul understood about God's grace and not to fall into the trap of the world. And it's easy. It's so easy to fall into the trap of the world. Are you better off, and I've shared this often, are you better off than a year ago? Have you created some new habits for him? Expect God to be there with you every step of the way. That's the good news. God is sitting here perched in your heart as I share it. God just speaks every now and again. Do we pay attention to him? Or are we too busy with our to-do list? Are we too busy because the person we're hanging around with isn't God-like and taken and drawing us away from God? And that's where we examine the circle of friends that we have, the circle of people that we associate ourselves with. There are people in this world that do love God as much as we do, as much as you do. It may be hard to find them sometimes, but there are people that love God and they will share the living Christ with you. you. may have to work at it a little bit, but there are people. Are we better off than a year ago? I'm going on four years being here in March. I pray you're not the same person you were four years ago. I pray something has changed in you. And I pray that you're continually working towards perfection in Jesus Christ. That's our goal. That's our responsibility. That's what we're to do. Know this. The closer your relationship draws to the one that offers eternal life, Your desire to sin becomes less and you will bear much fruit. When we're on that saddle of grace, we will find that we're not interested in sinning because it doesn't please God. We won't want to sin. We won't want to make the, the tough choices in the wrong way. We won't want to hang around with the person that talks about people that then talks about God. God is sitting on your heart right now, whispering to you, come to me, my child. In Jesus' name.